Good evening. My name is Mary Courage, and I'm the Interim Dean of Science. Welcome, and we hope you enjoy the lecture this evening. I'm going to begin by giving you just a little background on Elizabeth Laird, who provided the funds for these uh, regular seminars that we've been having. Basically, Elizabeth Rebecca Laird was a remarkable woman. She was well ahead of her time in many ways, a scientist, a scholar, innovator, teacher, mentor, administrator, traveler, and a tireless volunteer. All in all, not too shabby for a little girl born and raised in the 19th century. She was also, it seems, a very private person who did not seek the limelight. Dr. Laird was born in Owen Sound, Ontario in 1874. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in math and physics from the University of Toronto in 1896. A brilliant student, she achieved the top marks in her class for three years running and was awarded the University Gold Medal at Convocation. Sadly, her scholarship applications for graduate studies in Canada were rejected because she was a woman. Not to be deterred, she taught at a girls' school for a couple of years and then accepted a postgraduate fellowship from Bryn Mawr that enabled her to study physics abroad. She took up the fellowships at the Humboldt University of Berlin, where her research on magnetization received high praise. However, loyalty brought her back to Bryn Mawr, where she completed a PhD in physics in 1901. Her thesis was titled The Absorption Spectrum of Chlorine. Two years later, she joined the faculty at Mount Holyoke College, a position she held for almost 40 years. <clears throat> Over her long and distinguished career, she remained a productive scientist, publishing papers and holding research fellowships at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, first woman to do so, at Yale, at the University of Würzburg, and at the University of Chicago, all of this while still serving as head of the physics department. Importantly, she was also a dedicated teacher and an enthusiastic role model for the many young women she mentored and inspired to study science. She retired in 1940 with emeritus status and returned home to London, Ontario. Her official retirement didn't last long as she presented herself at University of Western Ontario wondering if she might continue to do research on a volunteer basis. She did and eventually became an honorary professor of physics there. During World War II, she worked on sensitive projects involving the application of radiation to radar development for the National Research Council, research she continued to expand well into her second retirement in 1953. Dr. Laird received many national and international honors, awards, and commendations over her career. She remained intellectually engaged well into both of her retirements. When she died at the age of 94, she was described by colleagues as the rare combination of a conscientious and productive researcher and an inspiring and able teacher. In 1969, Memorial University received notification that it was among several Canadian universities that had been named a beneficiary in the will of the, doctor, of the late Dr. Elizabeth R. Laird. The bequest was to be held and used as a lecture fund for the purpose of providing occasional public lectures in the field of science and social studies to be given by lecturers from some other part or section of Canada. Why Memorial was selected for the gift remains a mystery. In spite of a diligent search of available background information about her, we were unable to find any connection that tied her to Memorial or to Newfoundland and Labrador. Needless to say, we are very grateful for her generosity. The Elizabeth R. Lectures series was inaugurated in 1980 and has been held regularly since 2010. We've heard many inspiring talks from physical, biological, and social scientists in many fields journalists, politicians of all stripes, diplomats, and activists. We continue the tradition tonight. The 2017 Laird Lecture, hosted by the Faculty of Science and the Department of Computer Science, will be given by Dr. Jonathan Schaefer, Professor of Computer Science and Dean of Science at the University of Alberta. So now I'm going to turn the proceedings over to Min Lung Gong, the Chair of Computer Science here at Memorial, and he'll introduce Dr. Schaefer. Uh, good evening and uh, welcome. It's my uh, great honor to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Schaefer here uh, this evening. Uh, doc Dr. Schaefer is a Dean of Science at the University of Alberta and a professor of the, in the Department of Computing Science there. He was previously the Vice Provost and Associate VP of Information Technology at U of A. Dr. Schaefer's research area is in artificial intelligence he is best known for his work on applying AI technology in games. 
his checkers playing game, uh, Chinook, was recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records as the first computer program to win a human world championship in any game, which occurred in the year 1994. In 2007, Dr. Schaefer announced that in the Journal of Science, the game of checkers has been solved, which means perfect play from both sides of the player will result in a draw. This was the largest computational problem to be solved in, to date with 500 billion billion possible solutions. In his book titled One Jump Ahead, Computer Perfection at Checkers, Dr. Schaefer shared how Chinook defeated all the world's top human players within four years, but took another 14 years to fully solve the game. Honored as a fellow of the American Association for Artificial Intelligence in two, year 2000, Dr. Schiffer was, uh, became a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 2007. He received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Canadian Society of Computational Studies of Intelligence in 2008 and a prov Province of Alberta Centennial Awards in 2005. He is also a founder of uh, Anri, which is a not-for-profit spin-off company from the University of Alberta and is the first massive online, open online course production company in the world. So without further introduction, let's welcome Dr. Schaeffer to give us his talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's a, it's a beautiful, brisk day in Memor at, uh, here at, on, in, in St. John's. Uh, the last time I was here, oddly enough, it was rainy and foggy, and so uh, clearly that time was the exception, and today is, is clearly the norm. Um, I've been very fortunate uh, in that uh, I have um, the world's greatest job. You may think that you have the world's greatest job, but you don't, because I do. And the reason is I have the world's greatest job is because I love to play games. And because I love to play games, um, I leverage that into an academic career to do artificial intelligence. And uh, what I do is I do research into artificial intelligence, and I use games as my experimental test bed. There are lots of other real-world problems that I could pl apply AI to, but games are fun, and I like, to, I like to have fun when I'm working. And so if you ever come into my office and you see me playing a game, I'm not wasting time. That's, that's research. At least that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Right now, um, we're really fortunate in that artificial intelligence is one of these hot areas. Everybody's talking about artificial intelligence. The reality is that AI has been maturing as a field for really 60 years and has been, uh, been uh, deployed in, in important production uh, applications for about 20. And for some reason in the past year or so, people have discovered that AI is critically important. It is going to be transformative to society and everybody's talking about it. In a year or two, that will go away, and um, AI will continue to work behind the scenes and develop new revolutionary technology. But while we've got the limelight, we might as well exploit it. What I want to do today, because this is a general audience, is this is a gentle introduction to artificial intelligence. Guess what? Using games as an example to explain the ideas. And what I want to do is convince you that there really isn't a lot of magic to artificial intelligence when it, when it really comes right down to it. And then I want to talk about what's happening in, in Canada today, and particularly with the uh, University of Alberta. So, this is not a surprise to you. We've gone through a computer revolution, and that happened really going back many, many decades, but it really accelerated with the advent of, of the personal computer. But what's happening now is much more profound because that revolution is evolving into this evolution. 
and where the profoundity comes from this notion that we need to rethink what it means to think. Because what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is getting to computer to do things that you and I would do. Now, let's cast our minds back to the year 2000. That's 17 years ago, which means many of you don't actually remember that year very well. But I remember it extremely well because I love reading magazines and newspapers. And I'm a, I don't know why, I'm a junkie for reading lists. And in that magic moment when we switched from 1999 to the year 2000, there were lists everywhere because there were lists like for the end of the year, like what were the top 10 movies of the year or the 10 biggest news stories or the 10 most popular products of the year. But then there was the decade, the 1990s. And there was also the century, the 1900s. There was even the millennium, the last thousand years. It was a magic time. And if you like lists, there were lots of lists. And of course, being a scientist, I would look at the, at the science lists. And you could talk about what were the greatest inventions. For example, of the 1900s, a whole century. And you think back, wow, what happened in the 1900s? The computer got invented. Airplanes. We went to the, to the moon. Refrigeration the cell phone, all sorts of things happened in the 1900s. And yet, when the people talked about science, there was one contribution that nobody ever mentioned that I thought should have been there. Because I believe one of the most profound, deeply profound and moving contributions of the 20th century is the realization that intelligent behavior can be achieved using non human, non-biological information processing architectures. This is a brain. There's a computer in here. It's a quarter of an inch square. It's got a bit of memory around it. And yet this computer inside this phone can do amazing things. And that's deeply moving. I don't want to get into the religious aspects, but when you think about what we and our, our ego, if you will, as human beings and our superiority think about intelligence and the realization that we're uniquely qualified to do things that animals can't do and plants can't do and rocks can't do, and yet we're able to take this and have it do things like play chess is truly amazing. And what's at the heart of this is a computer chip, and that computer chip is a rock. It's a piece of silicon with electrons flowing through it, and that's it. And yet, it can do something that is very deeply, profoundly human. It can do intelligence or intelligent behavior. And so now, we have actually two different architectures for intelligence. Presumably, you're familiar with the one on the left the human brain, as we call it. It's this, I don't know, four or five pounds, it's squishy and gooey. Um, and that computer, we call it a brain, and it's the gold standard for intelligence. But the 20th century gave us a new architecture, a new computing engine. There's a printed circuit board there's a computer chip on there, one of the small little squares. There's some memory on there, a few more squares. And that's it. It's not squishy, it's hard. The chip is a rock. There's no moving parts. You can't even tell if it's on or off. It's just there. But it exhibit, can exhibit some amazing behavior. But whereas the thing on the left we says is intelligent, it can do amazing things, what I like to think about on the what we work with on the right, is we're not creating intelligence, we're creating the illusion of intelligence. I have no illusions about what I do and what my research is. Is it actually doing what I'm doing in my brain? Absolutely not. But from my perspective and from many of my colleagues' perspective, it's not how it does it, it's the end result that matters. The fact that it plays chess 
and plays at a grandmaster or superhuman level is all that matters. How you got there doesn't matter. And that shouldn't be a surprise because we've already known very well that what biology and evolution inspires doesn't mean that technology has to duplicate. When you think of flying, we know how nature evolved birds and flapping wings, and of course when we tried to, uh, the Wright brothers tried to replicate that, that didn't work very well, and you ended up with a completely different architecture. And now we have jet airplanes, and obviously they're much more practical, much more cost effective, and can carry much greater loads than flapping wings. And it's the same with these two engines of computing. The human brain can do amazing things, but we don't have to copy that architecture. We can engineer something that's perhaps better. And so I'm not creating intelligence, but I'm creating the effect of intelligence. It looks like it, and that's all that matters. And it won't surprise you that with these two architectures for intelligent behavior, that they have different strengths. So what are you and I good at? If you think about what I'm doing right now, it's absolutely amazing. I'm standing in front of you. I'm talking to you. Somehow in my brain, ideas are flowing. Those ideas are being translated into words and being constructed into a sentence. And I'm verbally presenting that to you, and presumably you're understanding it. But at the same time, I'm looking out at you, and I can see the roof and the, the stairs and your clothing and your hair and the glasses and all the different colors. The amount of information you're processing right now through your eyes is stunning. It's enormous. And you're not even aware that you're doing it, and it just happens naturally. I don't know how to replicate that. It's incredible. We're really good at language and vision processing and generalization and creativity. I mean, we, we, we created a Shakespeare. I mean, look how, what, how, what an amazing artistic accomplishment that is. And so our brain is really good at doing certain things. But computers are very good at doing other things. For example, calculations, tasks, large infallible memory. If I ask you, um, if I ask my computer to compute a third order partial differential equation to 64 digits worth of accuracy, bang, no problem. It's easy for computers to do that kind of stuff. If I ask it to do something repetitiously, like iterate on an algorithm, do it a hundred times. Nah, that's too easy. Do it a thousand, a million, do it a billion times. Computer will do things repetitiously. If I ask my computer to memorize the Wikipedia, It'll do that, and it'll do it flawlessly. So there are things that the computer is very good at doing that the human isn't good at doing. And again, it goes back to the analogy of birds with flapping wings and, and airplanes with, with jet engines. There are some things that birds do very well, and there are some things that airplanes with jet engines do very well. But what's really amazing about these two architectures of intelligence is that they're complementary. If I'm going to solve a problem, I want to exploit the strengths and not the weaknesses. And the weaknesses are just complements of the strengths. So are you going to solve a third order partial differential equation to 64 digits worth of accuracy in a second? Tell you what, I'll give you a break. You can have a minute to solve it. No, you're not going to do that. If I asked you to repeat a task a billion times, you might do it 10 or 100 times, and then you're going to get bored, but you're not going to do it a billion. If I ask you to memorize all the Wikipedia, you're not going to do it. It's not that you couldn't. It'd be very, very difficult. The human brain has strengths and it has weaknesses. But similarly, my computer has weaknesses. Its language capabilities are terrible. Its vision processing capabilities don't match anything that you and I have. And creativity, can you imagine a computer uh, creating uh, you know, an opera or mimicking Beethoven? Um, we haven't reached that level yet. So you've got the human brain, you've got the computer, 
They have strengths, they have weaknesses, and the two are complementary. And so what I want to do now is talk about what AI is, what artificial intelligence is, and I'm going to use three games to illustrate what's going on. And I'm hoping that you're going to come away with a thought that says, boy, computers are really stupid. Because what they're doing in solving these problems is exploiting what computers are very good at doing and not what they're very bad at doing. And so the methods for solving these problems are so foreign to us. They're easy, but they're foreign to us, and they're not solutions that we would ever try ourselves. So I'm going to start off with my own personal example, which is the game of checkers in 1994. Here's the human computer. Uh, this computer is called the Marion Tinsley model. It was uh, created, um, it was designed and uh, fabricated in uh, 1929. Uh, it was the only uh, computer of that particular model that was built in uh, 1929. Um, this is a picture of it in uh, 1992. Unfortunately, uh, at that time, the uh, warranty for this uh, particular machine had long expired, which which is actually a real problem with these human computer models. They, uh, they have warranties, lifetime warranties, that aren't as long as we'd like them to be. Um, but this is, if you want to, sh to demonstrate artificial intelligence, you want to show that computers are better than humans in this area, this is the person you had to beat. World champion for many years, virtually unbeatable. And here's the machine. These are the team of people. In fact, the machine is right there in the middle. It looks like a little refrigerator. Um, inside were actually 16 computers all cooperating together. And there were four people standing around uh, who are basically, um, well, at the time of the competition, were babysitters because it's all the refrigerator in the middle who uh, is doing all the work. And here's how the two stack up. You've got the Tinsley human computer, and you've got the Chinook a silicon computer, and you can compare the two, and, and the differences are quite stark. Tinsley was 65 years old in 1994 when he played Chinook. Uh, Chinook was only five years old. Tinsley had been competing for 42 years. At least that was at his prime. He, of course, spent many years before that studying the game, and Chinook was a rambunctious child. It was only a mere four years old. What was amazing about Tinsley is that he was more computer than human because in the 42 years that he was on top of the game, he only lost three times. Can you imagine playing the best people in the world over a span of 42 years, uh, a few thousand games, and you only lose three? I mean, that's the kind of performance you expect out of a computer, not out of a human, a mere mortal. Uh, my computer over those four years lost 25 games. We made a lot of programming mistakes. On the other hand, uh, Tinsley had an enormous computing edge, absolutely enormous computing edge, because in that squishy brain of his, 100 trillion synapses. You have these neurons, which are like tiny computers, and you have these connections with synop synapses. 100 trillion of them. We only had 16 silicon chips. So in some sense, we had... Uh, he had a vast computing uh, advantage. He had an amazing memory. Any time he, he studied a game or played a game, he, he memorized it. He knew it. Thousands of games, he could just reel them off. And that's pretty impressive, um, but um, didn't make a difference for my program. I took advantage of the fact that computers could memorize a lot of things, and uh, I trained my computer to memorize 40 trillion positions. Huge advantage for the machine over the human. Uh, both the power sources were uh, essentially uh, electrical, and Tinsley was a perfect gentleman, a wonderful person to be around, and he once described Chinook as being rambunctious because the computer had no social etiquette. It uh, treated Tinsley just like it treated everybody else. It just wanted to crush him and showed him no respect whatsoever. And here's the result. In 1994, Chinook became the first program to win a human world championship. As I already told you, uh, there was a warranty on the Tinsley computer, and uh, when we played him in 1994, it was past his best before date, and unfortunately in 1995, um, 
the his warranty on his hardware ran out and, and uh, it expired and unfortunately there were no replacement parts. It's one of the big advantages of our artificial intelligence computers is you can put in replacement parts. Uh, the project continued on until 2007 when checkers was solved. Um, solving checkers is a big, big problem. You, you, know, you think of tic-tac-toe as being solved. It's a trivial game. You know the perfect play leads to a draw. Um, but there's only a few hundred unique states in, uh, in uh, tic-tac-toe. Uh, checkers has 500 billion billion. That's a five followed by 20 zeros. Massive number of possibilities. So here's the secret. How do you build a computer program to beat a human program? 500 billion billion possibilities. How do you sift through it? Human can't sift through that. Well, what we did is we built a database. We took advantage of the fact that the computers don't get tired. We started a computer program in 1989, which ran continuously on hundreds of computers around the world till 2005 and then started up a new program in 2005, which ran until 2007 to solve the game. Can you imagine working on a problem, computers working ceaselessly from 1989 to 2005, running the same program over and over again on hundreds of computers, all combining their results? Humans couldn't do that. What we did is we built a database of positions and memorized it. So. Um, Checkers, you don't need to know the rules, but it starts off with 24 pieces on the board. As pieces are captured, the number gets reduced. And what we did is build a database for every single possible position with 10 or, few, 10 or fewer pieces on the board. And for every single one of those positions, we computed whether it was a perfect play led to a win, a loss, or a draw. So if ever you did an analysis and you came to a position with 10 pieces on the board, you could stop because you could go to this database and look up the answer. No human could possibly memorize the 40 trillion positions that we computed for this program and stored in its memory. And so the secret for why Chinook became superhuman isn't because it mimicked what Marion Tinsley did or memorized the patterns that humans do or did the same kind of reasoning as what humans did. The computers just did analysis and memorized 40 trillion data points and used that to solve the game. And some people, they talk to me about it and say, well, that's cheating, because I don't have that memory. Why should a computer be allowed to memorize 40 trillion positions? You have to remember what I'm doing, or we're doing in the AI community is exploiting what computers are good at. It's not cheating. We're just doing things differently. Let's talk about chess. 1997 was the milestone year. And here's the human computer, the Garry Kasparov model, who was then the world champion. And this is the challenger, the computer. This is an IBM computer. Um, one of the things about the IBM computer, which I think is really important, is uh, you can see there it actually contained 512 processors uh, in two refrigerators. And those processors generated a lot of heat. And so a real advantage of these uh, uh, computers, that, uh, these physical computers that we, built, that we built, is you could design them for human uh, user interface. So because there was so much heat being generated by these uh, chips, they had to have an enormous cooling system in there. So you could actually open it up, and there was a very nice, convenient spot to store your beer. And I thought it was very handy to be able to doing research and having a refrigerator as part of the, uh, the core infrastructure. Uh, this is the team, uh, a picture of the team of people who, who worked on uh, Deep Blue. Um, I think the, per the most important person is the person on my right, um, just uh, hovering over the, uh, the far right, hovering over the computer monitor. His name is Murray Campbell. Uh, he was born in Edmonton. He did his bachelor's and master's degree at the University of Alberta. Um, he then moved to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh where he did his PhD and then moved on to IBM to do, to do Deep Blue. So he is one of the three co-authors of Deep Blue. The other three people in the picture are supporting people. Uh, Murray still comes to Edmonton every year. His mother and brother still live in town. So there's a very strong unit of 
of Alberta, and Canadian connection to Deep Blue. And here's the, uh, the comparison between Kasparov and Deep Blue. They were the same height, and uh, Kasparov was a svelte 80 kilograms, played tennis every day, but Deep Blue was grossly overweight. De Deep Blue was 1,100 kilograms, no physical exercise, just sat in the corner of the room, was the laziest possible uh, intelligent entity you can imagine, just sat there and did nothing except cool beer. Kasparov was 34 years old, but this is very interesting. Deep Blue was a half a year old. The physical hardware had been born just literally a few months before the match. Whereas Kasparov's mental age was 34 years old, Deep Blue's mental age was 11 years because it had started 11 years earlier as a, as a, in a different incarnation and that software had been evolving. But one of the nice things about our computer architectures that don't work very well with our human architectures is you can pick up that knowledge, that software, and move it to another machine. Very difficult to do with our human computers. And again, Kasparov has this massive computing advantage with 50 billion neurons in his brain. Deep Blue had a pathetic amount of comp computation in comparison, 512 chips. But a fundamental difference is these computers that we have in our brain, these neurons, they are slow. They are awfully slow. A typical human can analyze two chest positions a second. That's it. Two. Deep Blue, on the other hand, this is 1997 technology, had the ability to analyze a billion positions per second but because of the rushed state of getting ready for the match, their software was only able to handle 200 million per second. So Kasparov had this big computing advantage, but it did not translate into a speed advantage. Where he made up for it is he had incredible knowledge about the game, and Deep Blue's knowledge was primitive. In fact, computers, physical computers, have real trouble with knowledge, at least non-factual knowledge. Humans are very good about fuzzy reasoning and computers are very bad. And so you have this trade-off. So what was the result? In 1997, Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov. Two wins, one loss, and three draws. But it was an exhibition match. IBM offered Kasparov a million dollars to play the match. And Kasparov said, sure and expected to win. He was rudely surprised. In 1997, most experts, including myself, believed that Gary Kasparov was still the better player in the world. Unfortunately, uh, an, a leaked IBM document said that the 1997 match generated, quote, $250 million of free, favorable publicity for IBM, unquote. And if they played Gary Kasparov another match and possibly lost, they would lose a lot of that free, favorable publicity. So IBM decided not to play Kasparov again, um, disbanded the team, dismantled the hardware, and ended the project, much to Gary Kasparov's uh, eternal rage. In 1997, there was doubt as to who was better, man or machine, but today there is no doubt. 2005 may go down as a, a historic year. That is the last time that a human beat a strong computer program in serious, under serious uh, tournament conditions. 2005, and in that game, the computer was winning and just got confused and made a terrible move and ended up losing. But it's been 12 years since a human has been able to beat a strong computer at chess. So why was Deep Blue so good? Well, chess is a huge problem. Checkers had 10 to the 20th possibilities. We don't know the exact size of chess, but it's around 10 to the 45th. A one followed by 45 zeros. The secret that Deep Blue employed was massive amounts of computing to take advantage of the speed of these physical computers. Just like jet engines are much faster than birds, Computer chips are much faster than the human brain. And so they built 
a special computer chip that played only chess. It was an idiot savant. If you asked it what's one and one, the chip couldn't answer. If you wanted to use it to edit a document, it had no idea what you were talking about. All it knew was there was an 8x8 board, and there's six different types of pieces, and there's white and black, and it knew how to make moves and search, and that's it. A chip to play only chess. And when you design it to play only chess and you get rid of all the other stuff, it goes very fast. And that's why, with these 512 chips that were designed and built uh, by IBM researchers, it could do 200 million chess positions per second. In other words, 100 million times faster than anything a human could do. And that's 1997 technology. It's obviously the gap is much greater today. But you know when you're doing 100 million times more things than a human, you don't have to be smart. That's one of the amazing things we learned about computers is that you can replace knowledge with search. You and I study our lives to learn things and what we do is we learn pieces of knowledge, heuristics that help guide us. But these computers in Deep Blue is incredibly dumb. It has very little knowledge of chess. But when you're searching 200 million chess positions a second, you can search almost everything. You can search 10, 15 moves ahead and look at every single scenario and choose the best one. A human could never do that because you can't do 200 million positions a second, which means you study the game to learn rules. And in a typical move, which might be two or three minutes, you might look at a few hundred positions. And out of that, you have to make a value decision as to what the best path to take is. And so we use a completely different approach. And the computer uses the dumb approach. I've got speed on my side. I'm going to look at everything as deeply as I can. And I'll take the best. Different approach. Doesn't mean it's right or it's wrong. But the results are very, very impressive. Let's go to 2016, last year, the game of Go, the oriental game of Go. This is the champion, Lee Sedol. And here's who he had to play. Team out of the blue caught the world by surprise. Google DeepMind in London built a program called um, AlphaGo to play Go. In the bottom picture is, uh, uh, is the server cluster of, of over 1,000 processors that they use. So again, taking advantage of using massive computing. And this match took place uh, in Korea. And there's the uh, AlphaGo team uh, in Korea. And uh, it's, you can't see it very well. But um, right in the center under uh, the word uh, where it says challenge match, right under the word match, is David Silver, who was the lead of the AlphaGo team. He did his PhD at the University of Alberta. Beside him to my right is Aja Wang, who did a, his postdoc at the University of Alberta. Uh, seven of the 20 people who did AlphaGo were from the University of Alberta. And uh, they developed um, this program that, was that really just stunned everybody. Um, Go was considered like the grand challenge problem, and the progress had been quite slow in terms of producing world-class play. But 2016 changed everything. Lee Sedol uh, was an, um, is an amazing player. Um, he'd won 18 world championships, 18. Unbelievable. When he played AlphaGo, AlphaGo had played six games. That's it. Six games, public games. How do you get to play the world champion when you've only played six games? Well, DeepMind had built a compelling case that this program was very strong. They had played six games against the European champion and beat the European champion. And the game showed sufficient depth that intrigued Lee Sedol, and he agreed to play. And he was supremely confident that he was going to crush the computer. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. Um, AlphaGo, uh, 
as I said, had only played six published games, but in fact it had played millions of games, tens, maybe hundreds of millions of games. Because what AlphaGo did is it doesn't get bored. So it just played itself over and over again. You have one version of the program play the other. And then again, and again. And it would learn something by playing itself over and over again. Imagine how good a player you would be if you played a game millions or hundreds of millions of times. And a computer can do that, and humans can't. Whereas checkers was 10 to the 20th, and chess is 10 to the 45th, go, the search space, is 10 to the 100th. It makes the number of atoms in the universe look like a tiny number. It's a vast search space. 10 to the 100th positions. What's amazing about a game that's that difficult and that complex isn't that a computer can eventually play it well. What's impressive is that humans could play it, that we were able to study the game and learn patterns and learn what to do and not to do at a level of sophistication that allowed us to master a game that is so overwhelmingly complex, which is an incredible tribute to what our human brain is capable of doing. Well, AlphaGo did it. And most people, including myself, never predicted that. I figured it was a few decades away. Because to master a game like that, everybody, including myself, believed that you needed to add lots of knowledge. And how do you get knowledge? Well, nobody's found a good way for computers to acquire the kind of knowledge that you and I have. And AlphaGo just basically ignored the problem and did um, something very impressive. And the secret is learning. And you may have heard deep learning. It's the big buzzword these days. This new technology that was invented by primarily Jeff Hinton at the University of Toronto and um, Joshua Bengio at, at Université de Montréal. And really, it's actually nothing new. It's, it's um, a big neural net. And anybody in computer science will know that neural nets have been around 60, 70, 80 years. And what neural nets are is a pseudo analogy to how the human brain works. The human brain is a network of neurons. And so these neural nets are supposed to be an analogous to how the brain works. And each one of these circuits is a little neuron, just a little computer that does something quite trivial. And each of those arrows represents uh, a connection. And so what you have in this neural network is essentially input to it, which is essentially a go position. You have all these connections, and what they produce at the end is a number. Here's a position. The position filters through this neural net, and out comes a number. And if the number is big, it means the position is good. If the number is small, it means the position is bad. And that's it. But the trick is, how do you put the knowledge into that neural network? And the answer is, you play millions and millions of games. And you use a technique that was primarily invented by Rich Sutton, who's at the University of Alberta, called reinforcement learning. You play against yourself. And at the end of the game, you know the result. You won or you lost. And let's say you won. You know that the end result is that you won. But somewhere along that line, from the start of the game to the end of the game, you did some things right that resulted in a win. So all those moves along the way, you give them a small reward to say, we won the game. I have no idea what we did or why we won, but we won. And all the moves that got us to that win, we're going to give them a small reward. And for the side that lost, we don't know. We know that we lost. Why we lost, we have no idea. But all the moves that led to that loss, we're going to give them a small penalty because we lost. And some of those moves actually could have been good. Since we lost, they don't get the kind of reward that they should. And you make a small change. And now the program is different. Each of those circles has a different value in them. Reflect the fact that you won or you lost. And the numbers will change up or down a little bit. And a little bit means nothing. But when you play millions of games, if something is good, 
eventually the power of statistics shows up that this is really good and the number that's associated with that feature or that piece on that square or whatever it is gets bigger and bigger. And if it's bad, it gets more negative and negative. And if you just play a few hundred games, the numbers don't converge to anything meaningful. But when you play millions of games, good things rise to the top and bad things sink to the bottom. And the end result is this neural network does an amazing job of deciding whether a go position is good or bad. So um, this is the most sophisticated technology. It's more sophisticated than chess and deep blue. It's more sophisticated than what I did in checkers. But all of what AlphaGo did is standard machine learning technology, reinforcement learning and neural nets. And none of this would work unless you played millions and millions of games against yourself. Human could never do that, but computers can. We don't get bored. So here's a graph of the performance of these three programs over time. And you can see at the bottom axis is the year. And the, uh, the uh, vertical axis is a ranking, a rating system, if you will, where 1,000 is, uh, it's called an ELO rating. 1,000 is essentially a novice. You can see on the right that there are some lines um, where the average club player is, master, grandmaster, and world champion. You can see for checkers that with Samuel's program, it achieved a ranking of about 1,500 in the mid-1960s, an average club player. But you can see around about 1990 when I got involved with checkers, you can see then all of a sudden uh, there was a big jump and it kept going up and up until we were able to uh, solve the game of checkers. And then that flattens off because we're perfect and we never lose another game. Chess um, followed a similar path. It was a slow, a steady climb. You can see around 1995 there was a, a bump upwards. That was deep blue. But even then, it, at the end of the bump, it was not world champion level. But progress has continued with new algorithms and faster computers. And the program has just slowly written, uh, risen to the top so that Today, it is so superhuman, humans will never beat it again. And Go, well, the progress was terribly slow until early 2000s when Chaba Sapisveri, who's a professor at the University of Alberta, invented a new search algorithm, worked very well for the game of Go, and progress was immediate. And then, of course, uh, uh, it continued on with AlphaGo adding that last um, bit to uh, bring it up past the world champion level. And actually, I forgot to update this graph. I meant to because you may have known that about a month ago, AlphaGo, the AlphaGo team published a new paper in Nature magazine where they have a new version of the program which knows nothing about Go, nothing about Go except the rules. And now it beats the old version of the program 100 to 0. It is so much better than what played Lee Sedol last year. It just crushes it. And it knows nothing about Go except the rules. And in fact, you can swap out the rules and put in the rules for the game of chess. And guess what? It does the same thing. Humans have no chance against these programs anymore. Here's a visual takeaway of what's going on, and it's really the triumvirate of the modern information age. If you take a look at what we did in Checkers, which is 1994, we did a lot of computing and a little bit of learning, but it was all about the data, lots of data. Deep Blue took a different approach. They didn't use much data and they did not use much learning, but they invested in computing, fast chips. And Go in 2016 used a lot of computing and a lot of data, but it was all to support the learning. And so what we have today is this everything coming together with ubiquitous computing and massive amounts of computing, large data sets, and to be able to analyze those data sets and acquire massive amounts of information. And this is revolutionizing society today. Computers with data and mining the data. 
Now, I've talked about games, and you could say, well, who cares that Jonathan spent his career playing games? I mean, he has a great job, but does it really affect you that computers are superhuman at chess and checkers and go? It's not like you wake up in the morning and say, oh my God, I can't beat my computer in chess. How am I going to live? It just doesn't happen, right? I do research into artificial intelligence. I happen to use games because games are fun. But I don't do research into games. I do research into AI. I just demonstrate them using games. And so uh, most of the things you see here on this slide um, are applications of my research. And a couple things are applications of my colleagues' research. So for example, the stuff I've done is used in interactive entertainment. Um, we've developed technology that have been deployed by Electronic Arts and BioWare and Relic and other computer games companies. And they've, those games have sold millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of copies. Now, I'm not saying that you guys bought those games because there was my technology in it. No. Our technology is a very small part of the game, but nevertheless, AI and the technologies that we develop for game playing programs obviously applies to the video game industry. Here's an interesting thing is bioinformatics. So in 1995, we had a chance meeting with two professors uh, who were in the biochemistry department at the University of Alberta. And they were working on helping to decipher the human genome. And when we got to talking, we suddenly discovered that what they needed was exactly what I had done in the checkers program. See, the checkers program was using 40 trillion data points. And it had to use them in this game playing program, which had to make real time immediate decisions, which means it was using all these massive parallel computing resources, digging into data, uh, pulling out information very quickly and manipulating it. And that's what they needed in 1995 for the human genome, which was generating a massive amount of data. And you wanted to analyze the data, but the data needed to be compressed. And you needed lots of computing power to access and pull out the data. And so in 1995, much to my shock, I ended up being co-founder of a company called BioTools. And what we did is we developed commercial products to um, analyze and sequence DNA and, pro and protein. And who knew that, we, that I would evolve into working on a bioinformatics company and the back end engine for doing this analysis was a checker playing program. What it does is go to show the fundamental research. You never know where it's going to lead. Who would imagine that a checker playing program could help understand the human genome? Uh, navigation is another good example. Of the technology we developed uh, is used in GPS systems. It's pathfinding. Pathfinding is a single agent game. It's solving Rubik's Cube. Same technology. Uh, teaching. Uh, Ming Long mentioned uh, a startup company. It's called Onlia. It's a short for online and learning. We develop uh, engaging online learning experiences. Um, didn't know that my stuff would be useful for online learning. That's great. We've used it for scheduling and optimization problems and medical diagnosis. And so the point is, you develop the technology. And yes, games are a fun way to demonstrate the technology. And hey, they're also a great way to attract graduate students, because graduate students and undergraduate students love to play games. And so it's been uh, tremendous to be able to develop technology and use it in all sorts of other disciplines. But another application, of course, of all this work is people, training of people, HQP. And I single out two people here, uh, Lourdes Pena, who's not here, she's on sabbatical, and Dave Churchill, who's sitting there at the back, because uh, Lourdes was my master's student in the 1980s. She worked on computer poker. That's what her master's thesis was. And now she's doing what? Biology-related research? Uh, computer biology? Well, different path, but the same skill set. And well, Dave is a hardcore, real-time strategy gamer, and so we'll see where that goes. Uh, but the point here is that the people enjoyed games and enjoyed AI and used uh, games as a way of increasing their enjoyment of doing the research that they did. So the conclusion I want to make is that games have been an excellent test bed for AI research. 
But the important lesson I'm trying to tell you here is that there really isn't a lot of magic behind the scenes of what's going on. Computers are doing things in ways that are different than us. They're not wrong. They're not right. They're not intelligent like you and I are. They're not sentient. The end result is all that matters. And the fact that they do hundreds of millions of data points a second or memorize billions or trillions or gazillions of things is irrelevant. We expect the strengths of what a computer can do to achieve the results. Now, I want to summarize some things and just to put into perspective because I'm actually very proud of the work that we've done in artificial intelligence and games at the University of Alberta. So if you don't mind me bragging, this is a bragging slide. Because uh, we're very well known in, around the world for doing that. And so uh, the first world computer champion in any game was Checkers 1994, done at the University of Alberta. And chess, as you already know, in 1997, um, Deep Blue, one of the three co-authors, as I've already told you, was a U Alberta grad. In 1997, later that year, Michael Burrow, who's at the University of Alberta, developed a, uh, a, a program for the game of Othello, or it's also called Reversi, which crushed the human world champion. In 2000, uh, Backgammon became Superhuman, uh, Jerry Tesaro's program from IBM, using Rich Sutton, his reinforcement learning technology, and Rich is at the University of Alberta. In 2007, uh, my, my uh, computer programs that I'd started in 1989 stopped running because they had solved the game of checkers. 500 billion billion uh, positions were uh, no problem for my computer to sift through, and uh, the game was over. Checkers with perfect play is a draw, a U Alberta milestone. In 2008, um, we uh, achieved superhuman performance in Limit Texas Hold'em Poker. I seem to be addicted to long-running programs. Started the Checkers program in 1989, and it effectively ended in 2007. We started the Computer Poker Project in 1995, and Lourdes joined us, I think, 1998. But the, uh, the Poker Project went till 2017, and so it was 22 years in the making, and the first major milestone that we had was in 2003, where we showed a potentially uh, superhuman performance, but in 2008, we, we achieved it. Uh, the one games milestone that people talk about that we had no role in was the IBM Watson Jeopardy uh, game. In 2015, uh, limit two-player limit poker was solved. We achieved superhuman performance in 2008, but in 2015, Michael Bowling at the University of Alberta and his colleagues built a program that basically solved two-player limit poker. And of course, in 2016, uh, Go with AlphaGo, uh, with University of Alberta graduates and using Rich Sutton's uh, reinforcement learning technology. So University of Alberta has had this amazing track record of accomplishments of applying artificial intelligence to games and demonstrating incredible superhuman performance. Uh, oh, and this is kind of cool. Uh, this, uh, this is one of my bragging points. Um, uh, sitting at home one day and the phone started ringing off the hook because uh, in the game of Jeopardy, uh, we were one of the questions. A Canadian computer scientist showed that with best play, this game, also called drafts, will end in a draw. And of course, the answer is checkers. But they didn't know that. That's terribly disappointing. Okay. I have to give you a few updates because that's not the end of the story. So earlier this year in March, um, Michael Bowling had continued the poker playing software, and he beat world-class professionals at No Limit Poker. No Limit Poker is the variation you see on TV. It's where you can put all of your money into the pot. Limit Poker, which we'd solved earlier, had fixed amounts of money that you could put in. So in some sense, it was easier because you could only bet, say, $100. That's it. You could fold, call $100, or raise $100, and that was it. No limit, you can raise $99.95 if you want, or $2,349. Much harder problem because there are more possibilities. And earlier this year, announced uh, super 
human performance at poker. And that was great. That was a huge milestone. And we've received a lot of publicity and we're known around the world for all of the success in games. But we've been sort of flying under the radar because, as one of my colleagues said, what the hell are you guys doing in Edmonton, Alberta? Isn't that the subarctic? Well, okay, so there is some snow on the ground in Edmonton, but I wouldn't call it the subarctic. But typical Canadians, we just you know, don't go out and brag to the world about what we're doing. But somebody else had to do that. And earlier this year, um, an independent organization did a ranking of academic research uh, organizations, universities. And they, they did it based on identifying the tier one publications in the world and assessing how frequently uh, the institution published in those tier one venues. And you can see there's a long list of areas uh, that they assessed. And if you just look up at the top, you can see that I've turned on artificial intelligence and machine learning. And when you do that, uh, this graph shows from 2000 to 2017, you see that the University of Alberta is number two in the world. And in fact, for the last 25 years, we've ping-ponged between number two and number three in the world in terms of productivity research in the world's top premier places. And so when you hear all this news coming out of the University of Toronto and Montreal these days on AI, yeah, they're good research groups, but they're not number two. University of Toronto creeps in here at number 13. University de Montréal is, uh, last I saw was they were number 40 on this list. And so that's great, but we live in a country that is Toronto-centric, and sometimes Vancouver and Montreal share this, the limelight, but um, it's been very disconcerting to us that um, um, uh, we're sort of ignored. And I have a feeling that St. John's and Newfoundland in general has the same uh, problem that anytime you do something good, uh, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver seem to scoop you guys and, and take all the credit and uh, they do it right and apparently we don't do it. Anyway, this was wonderful and as a result of this, uh, people were shocked and uh, all of a sudden people started knocking on our door saying, we want to do AI and we want to work with the University of Alberta. And we had no idea you guys were that good. Well, we knew we were good and the AI community knew we were good, but nobody else seemed to know that we were good. And certainly Toronto and Montreal wouldn't admit that they were good. And then something amazing happened earlier this year, and I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of credit for it. The University of Toronto published an, editor, uh, uh, an editorial in the Globe and Mail in January, and they said, Canada really needs to invest in AI, and you really need to invest in the University of Toronto because it's great, and we really need a lot of money for a new AI building. And for many people, including myself, this was a terrible article, and if there's anybody here from the University of, Al uh, University of Toronto, um, I'm not going to back down on it. It was a terrible article. And uh, so I wrote a rebuttal, which got published in the Globe and Mail the following week. And uh, I just ridiculed the proposal. And I said, you know, we really are good in Canada. We're punching above our weight. And it's not just in Toronto, but it's, it's in Montreal, and it's in Edmonton. And it used to be very, very strong at, at the University of British Columbia until housing prices sort of destroyed their their AI group. And uh, I said, yeah, we need to do it, but we need a national strategy, not a Toronto strategy. And then much to my shock and everybody's shock, I think, a month later we got notified that the government was revising the federal budget to include $125 million for a national artificial intelligence strategy. This is the first time I have ever used the words nimble and government in the same sentence. So please don't quote me because I'm sure that will never happen again. But somehow the government got the message that we were really good in this country in artificial intelligence. World class. Truly world class. Not that crappy world class that everybody says. You know, I've got 300 professors in my faculty of science and every one of them is world class. No. No, they're not. But in artificial intelligence nationally, we are punching above our weight. We truly have world-class researchers. Deep learning and reinforcement learning are redefining AI, and guess what? Rich Sutton at the University of Alberta 
Jeff Hinton at the University of Toronto, Joshua Bengio at University de Montréal. Those are the three hottest scientists in artificial intelligence in the world today, and they're in Canada, and we should exploit it. And the government shockingly decided to do that. 125 million over five years, five million, uh, sorry, 25 million of it is coming to the University of Alberta. And so that was great. And all of a sudden, these companies are all buzzing around us. And so we had a big announcement in uh, July. Uh, Google DeepMind, the people who did AlphaGo, they know us very well because they have a lot of our graduate students in London. And so they set up their first non-London, their first international research center at the university, uh, sorry, in Edmonton, working closely with the University of Alberta. Uh, you can see the fellow with the... Um, the balding head is Rich Sutton, the father of reinforcement learning. Beside him is Michael Bowling, who uh, uh, has done some amazing research and on the side basically solved uh, two-player poker. And Patrick Polarski, who's uh, an AI researcher, but he's in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry because he takes his AI and applies it to smart prosthetics. Uh, when you lose a limb, he uh, trains the prosthetic to act like a natural limb. It's very amazing. And so uh, Google has uh, now set up shop uh, in Edmonton. And so uh, what's happened is we've had this amazing run with good luck and good fortune. And you've got to be careful what you wish for because until last year we were sort of under the radar and no, nobody bothered us and we all did our great research. And since in the last year, because of all the publicity and how AI has become hot and people have discovered that we're good, we have all these companies now setting up shop in Edmonton and building an ecosystem. But if you read the news and the media, it's all about Toronto and Montreal. And I'm here to say that there's more in this country than Toronto and Montreal. Uh, University of Alberta has got a fabulous group of people. UBC has been rebuilding its group. And across the country, there are excellent researchers in every jurisdiction across this, this country. You don't need to be at one of the three or four big universities in AI in this country to be doing outstanding research. And I'm delighted that the Canadian government has finally seen that we have a huge uh, competitive edge there. And although AI is hot now and maybe tomorrow it will be cold, the reality is that you need to be aware of is that uh, AI is not going away. It is transforming society. Uh, all you have to do is take a look at an, an auto autonomous vehicles and where that's going and how that is going to revolutionize society. And that technology is real. It's, it's ready for deployment in various parts of the world. And it's only legal and insurance uh, matters that are preventing it from happening. And so um, prepare for an incredible upheaval in society. Uh, AI is going to do all of that. And I guess I'll leave that as my last slide and I would be Delighted to take questions. Now, you were at pains uh, saying how computers are stupid, but there's still, I mean, when you, whenever you hear AI, the next thing you think, Hal. 9,000, and then you think about, well, even if you design them to be really only focused on one very specific thing, I mean, if you think about human mind, where the consciousness arises, if, if you look at a small group, it doesn't have it. So maybe the consciousness in us uh, arose if, if you reach some critical level. So are you concerned that you may be even though you're thinking they are stupid, at some level there will be a different layer of processing information which actually leads to self-awareness and then we have opening up the Pandora box. So we, we are creating the illusion of AI largely because I don't know what sentience means, I don't know what self-awareness means, and nobody knows what it means and how to program it. And so as long as we don't understand that, we are creating the illusion of intelligence because all of our computer programs right now are idiot savants. They're doing exactly what we tell them to do. It may not, the results may be unexpected, but it's doing exactly what we told us to, to do. So until we understand what sentience is or is not, um, I'm not afraid of, of what these computers 
uh, can do. Uh, but one day we may figure out what that is and then, yes, it's, it's going to be a very different world. Um, you know, there's an argument that says sentient is something that we made up because the more you look at the human brain, the more it looks just like a computer. And computers are deterministic and the human brain looks increasingly like it's deterministic as well. And if that's correct, then uh, uh, it really throws a very different light on our understanding of computers. So I'm not afraid uh, of, of what is going to happen in the near term. Long term, I don't know. But I do want to address one issue from what you said, because you mentioned how, because this is a question that happens all, every time I give a talk. Somebody asks it, and it's the logical um, progression of your talk is, you know, we're talking about using computers to do good things, but what about computers doing bad things? I mean, Hal did bad things. It was self-aware, and it, it, it did things that uh, it felt were important, like it wanted to preserve its life, even though it might cost the human a life. And so people always talk about the negative side of AI, and it's been a, a difficult time because you have people like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking warning about what AI can do. And it's true that there is a dark side to AI. There's no question that you can imagine taking uh, artificial intelligence and building killer robots and things like that, and science fiction is full of it. But you have to understand and you have to realize that everybody who's working in this field is doing it to the betterment of mankind. That's what we're here for. And every technology has a dark side. I mean, you know, we can think of what's happening right now with um, the amazing things with, with biology and how we might be able to change and manipulate the human genome and cure diseases and things like that. But you can also think about using that technology to create killer viruses. And we don't talk about that so much because we all know that there's a huge upside. Um, and so I'd like to believe that what we're doing is, is for the betterment of, of mankind. Um, but, you know, uh, we accept technology with its good points and its bad points. Uh, everybody in this room probably has a car or loves having a car. And yet one of the biggest killers in this world is the car. How many hundreds of thousands of people around the world lose their lives in traffic accidents? We're willing to put up the dark side of technology because the good side uh, is much to our advantage. So, uh, and I hope it will always stay that way. And I see AI as being a tremendous opportunity to improve our quality of life. There may be a downside somewhere, but I'm not concerned about it. Other questions? Yes. So um, <clears throat> I've done some casual um, research into AI myself. And a question I have, I suppose, to you is one of the biggest advantages I've seen posited for the human brain is how relatively little power it takes compared to, you know, these, like, you know, Deep Blue and um, these other programs. So I guess I was just sort of curious, is there anyone in AI currently in the field who's working on, you know, I guess more, you know, dynamic, I guess, low cost, like more efficient AI, as opposed to these, you know, big refrigerator sized heat sinks? So uh, a good question. Uh, what really happens is when you push technology, everybody wants to be first. In innovation, you want to be first because there's no prize for second place. Nobody remembers who came second. You only remember who came first. And so what you see with many of these uh, computer infrastructures, they re require a massive amount of work. Like Deep Blue, they invented their own computer chips. And AlphaGo used 1,000 computers. And when I did my stuff, we were using hundreds of computers around the world. But that's only because we wanted to be first. I've done the calculation. I could use a handful of computers, fast computers today, modern processors and uh, GPU units. I could do checkers not in 17 years, but in a couple of years using a handful of off-the-shelf computers. Why? Because when I started this project in 1989, computers weren't fast. Uh, as I told people earlier today, in 1990, I bought my first one gigabyte disk drive. One gigabyte. It was $5,000 US plus tax and shipping for one gigabyte. And so we're pushing the envelope because you're, 
You want to you want to get there first, which means you you do things that you normally wouldn't do. And now today, I don't know. I think this has 32 gigabytes on it, right? And my one gigabyte drive was like this big box, right? And this has got 32 gigabytes, and I don't know what's what's 32 gigabytes. 20 bucks? I don't know. 30 bucks? It's it's nothing, right? And so uh, you know, AlphaGo they played Go last year, and they used 1,200 processors. And now the new version, which they just published earlier this year, used 20? I think it was 20 tensor processors. I mean, within a year, they not only had a better program, but it used um, 1 50th of the computing power. And uh, you can buy a chess program. You, didn't need a big re you don't need a big refrigerator like Deep Blue. You can buy a chess program which will crush your ego, and it'll just, it's on your phone, right? And so uh, you see these big monstrous implementation, but that's only because people are pushing the edge of technology. And once they've done that, five years later, it's all been solved and compacted down to something really small. So the answer is yes, uh, that happens, and people work on it. Um, you mentioned in uh, 2005, uh, you had to replace the long running checker program that you wrote, and you replaced it with something new. I'm just a little bit curious what happened in 2005. Um, so there were two phases uh, to solving checkers. Um, what I started in 1989 is the game of checkers, you start with 24 pieces on the board, and it goes down to there's one piece on the board. And what I started in 1989 was solving the game from the end of the game towards the front. So moving up from one piece to two to three to four, all the way up to 10. And at the time, given the resources I had, that's as far as I could go that way. And in 2005, I stopped that process, and then I went to the start of the game and started going forward. And it took two years before that forward process and the backward process met. And so it was just a change of philosophy. If you're terribly familiar with it, could you explain why the new DeepMind is so much more, like, I guess, powerful and quicker and just generally better than the old DeepMind? <laughs> so in 2016, in January, the DeepMind people published the, their paper on AlphaGo, and basically it described the program that uh, eventually played Lee Sedol and beat him in 2016. And then about a month ago, they published a new paper where they have a new version of AlphaGo, which they call Alpha Zero, and it's much better. It's phenomenally better. And you're asking, why is it so much better? And the answer is, I don't know. And I've read the paper, and I read the paper in 2016 multiple times, and I read the paper in 2017 multiple times. And there's a few things, and I don't mean this in a way to disparage my colleagues at DeepMind. The first paper used standard technology, deep learning, reinforcement learning, uh, Monte Carlo tree search. Why it was so good, I have no idea. They put in some innovations in there that, OK, that was interesting. Uh, why you needed it, I don't know. But you, they put it in and achieved superhuman performance. And I, I'm not going to argue with the results. Obviously, these things worked. And then the second paper this year, they took out all of the innovations that they put in in 2016. They're all gone. And basically, they have an architecture which is um, very simple application of reinforcement learning and deep learning, and it plays very strong. And so what I don't understand is why they found the need to put in all those innovations in 2016, what motivated them, and what was the insights that allowed them to realize they could just get rid of all that stuff and go back to the basics. And so when you look at AlphaGo Zero, um, again, it's all mature technologies. There's nothing unusual about the program. And yet, um, the, what's un unusual about the program is just that it plays so phenomenally well. And uh, so I guess the AlphaGo Zero paper doesn't surprise me. Uh, it's the one last year that surprised me. Um, yeah. Uh, one of the things we discover in science is that you find a solution, publish it, and that sort of becomes a standard. And then as you uh, learn why things perform the way they did in a better way, 
you end up simplifying things. And AlphaGo represents, they found a solution, and now they've simplified it down to the bare minimum, and it turns out that the bare minimum is something that we already really understood very, very well. Uh, that's one of the beauties of science is that uh, everybody constantly takes work and brings it down to the simplest, purest form. And most ideas in science are actually quite simple and uh, um, elegant. And AlphaGo Zero is simple from the artificial intelligence point of view and elegant. In, uh, in these games, has the AI gameplay right here? <laughs> Has the AI gameplay changed how humans approach competitive play? Uh, interesting question. Um, changed their approach, um, but uh, I'm not sure that, but it, what it has happened is humans have gotten better. And one of the reasons why it, it took a while in chess to beat the world's champion is because the, the world champion could study the computers play and learn new things because the computer played differently and opened up new ideas. Now, I didn't know this until two weeks ago. Dennis Hassabis, who's the founder of DeepMind, was in Edmonton. And uh, I had dinner with him, and we were talking about it. And he told me two things that I didn't know. So last year, uh, they, he beat uh, uh, DeepMind, beat, uh, sorry, AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol. And Lee Sedol uh, studied those games that he lost. He studied them in depth, and he was intrigued by new ideas that um, um, AlphaGo exhibited in its play. And he learned something. Not sure what he learned. He's not, he isn't sure what he's learned, but he learned something. And he then went on a... He then started going back after an appropriate period of time of rest and recouping his confidence after getting crushed. He went on a 22-game winning streak against the world's elite players, like unheard of. And he's continued to just win everything in sight. And so he's a much better player. And earlier this year, uh, AlphaGo beat uh, in a three-game match... Um, uh, this amazing Chinese prodigy whose name I'm, I'm, is escaping me right now. And he crushed uh, this guy who's the current world champion three games to nothing. He's on, only 19 years old. And again, this kid, that's all how you describe him. He studied the games and he learned a lot. And uh, last I heard, uh, since, since playing and being crushed by AlphaGo, he's won his next 16 games in a row. And again, um, through this experience and playing the program, they learned something. And now uh, they're much stronger players than they ever were. And so the answer is yes, the computer is playing differently and exposing us to new ideas. And they're learning from that experience and they're much, much better players. And what's wrong with that? Um, I mean, we're creating these, these strong game playing programs. What's wrong with us you know, learning from them and getting better? But we'll never catch up. We'll never catch up to AlphaGo again. Hi. Um, I have the feeling that um, the research community was moving away from the artificial intelligence term to go towards branch like machine learning or uh, uh, image processing. But uh, recently, it seems like the AI term is coming back. Uh, I'm not sure if you agree with that or, or not. Now, what do you think about that? Well, first of all, uh, AI has never gone away. M machine learning is just one subset, one sub-branch of artificial intelligence. Robotics and vision and natural language and heuristics. So there's a whole bunch of areas. But artificial intelligence is a terrible, it's a terrible name. It goes back to John McCarthy, uh, who uh, was, was at MIT when he coined it, the phrase, and uh, it sort of stuck. What we're really doing, going back to my earlier slide where I said, we have intelligence and there's the brain and there's the computer. We're using the computer to mimic intelligence. We should be calling it 
computational intelligence. That's exactly what we're doing. And so computational intelligence has not come, has not been favored by the community, and I don't know why. What we see now popping up a lot more is the words machine intelligence as being a much more generic uh, name. So our, our research group in, in machine learning at the University of Alberta used to be called uh, the Alberta Innovate Center for Machine Learning, and last year we changed it to make it broader and more encompassing, and now it's the uh, uh, Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. And so I think machine intelligence is a much better description. Um, unfortunately, what you see right now everywhere is people are talking about machine learning, and they equate that with artificial intelligence. Machine learning is part of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is much bigger than just machine, lear uh, than just machine learning. But machine intelligence is a good way of thinking about it. So there's somebody way at the back who's 